Greetings. I'm Pastor Laura from Parker United Methodist Church, and it is good to be with you today. Uh, I wanted to share first what a wonderful Messiah Sunday we had this past weekend. I'm so grateful for the hard work that made this happen. Um, so many people pitched in and sang and performed, and it was a wonderful event. Not only did we have two amazing presentations of the Messiah, but we also had a wonderful, um, sponsored by our children and youth ministries, we had a potluck with reindeer games and we even hosted Santa on that day. And later in the afternoon, we had a great performance of the Forte Handbell Quartet. It was truly a beautiful day to get us into the holiday spirit. But yet we are in the midst of Advent. And during our sermon series, we've been considering the unsung players in the nativity scenes that we have. We know that uh, we know a lot about Mary and Joseph and Jesus, but there are others that play an important role in this important story. A couple of weeks ago, we heard the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. In the next couple of weeks, we'll hear about the Magi or the wise men, and we'll hear about the shepherds. And my guess is that most of us have some of those characters in our nativity scenes. But there's another character who played an important role, and it's one that's never depicted in the nativity scene, or at least it's not one I've ever seen. Why? Because he's the villain of our story. And who am I talking about? But King Herod. So here this scripture reading from Matthew chapter 2 using the message translation. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village in Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship, a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth and were on pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified, and not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together, and he asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they told him, Bethlehem, Judah territory. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east. Pretending to be as devout as they were, he got them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, go find this child, leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word and I will join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. Then the star appeared again, the same star they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshiped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod, so they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. After the scholars were gone, God's angel showed up again in Joseph's dream and commanded, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Stay until further notice. Herod is on the hunt for this child and wants to kill him. Joseph obeyed. He got up, took the child and his mother under cover of darkness, and they were out of town and well on their way by daylight. They lived in Egypt until Herod's death. This Egyptian exile fulfilled what Hosea had preached, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod, when he realized that the scholars had tricked him, flew into a rage. He commanded the murder of every little boy two years old and under, who lived in Bethlehem and its surrounding hills. He determined that age from information he'd gotten from the scholars. Not a great story to hear during this Christmas season, is it? Now, this is not a story that we tell very often. Maybe we don't want to disturb the beautiful silent night image with our candles raised high. 
Or maybe we don't want to consider the PG-13 part of the story, especially as we share it with our children. Or maybe we don't want to hear about children being in harm's way. After all, we hear about this and see this on the news each and every day. I think we are to hear the story that Matthew tells through the lens of the Hebrew people, the Jewish perspective. For they had a similar villain many generations ago. While enslaved in Egypt, the big baddie was Pharaoh, the one who was worried about the Hebrew people and ordered baby boys born of the Hebrews to be killed. The one who denied Moses when he said, let my people go until Pharaoh's own son was killed in the final plague. These are stories we don't like to tell or have our children hear, but they are part of the story. They are part of our story. They are part of God's people's story. They are part of the story of Jesus Christ, who encountered two other villains at the end of his story, Caiaphas and Pilate. Yet our culture is filled with stories that includes villains. Whether in Lord of the Rings, you've got Sauron and Saruman, or in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you have the White Witch. Or in the MCU, you have Big Baddie Thanos. Or in the DC world, you have Joker and Lex Luthor. And those are just a few of the fictional ones. Or if you're into college football and you're a Florida State fan, the new villain is the College Football Playoff Committee. And if you know, you know. Because there's something about our culture that wants to find and define villains. It's good to know that we are right and they are wrong, that we aren't as bad as them because we want to feel better about ourselves. But it's just too simple, isn't it? Is every villain 100% evil, impossible to be redeemed? In our movies, there's a genre of telling the origin story of villains, perhaps trying to understand how they became villains, whether it's the story of Cruella de Vil or Joker or Maleficent or even Darth Vader. During the Christmas season, I think of a very popular villain, a very popular redemption story of a villain in How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Remember, it begins with a bitter and angry Grinch who was angry at the Who's in Whoville. In the Jim Carrey version, it, they try to explain how the Grinch got to be so bitter and angry. But what happens at the end of the Grinch story? Little Cindy Lou Who shows Grinch a little love, a little forgiveness. And the Who's in Whoville show Grinch that um, happiness is about, not about things, but it's about the joy in your heart. And by the end of the story, Grinch's heart grew how many sizes? But three sizes that day. Our um, book that we're using for Advent, written by author Rachel Billups, she suggests that there's a little bit of villain in each of us. Perhaps we have been hurt and we lash out with hurt. Or maybe we're just having a bad day. When have you responded more like a villain than a hero? Because we all have bad days. I thought about this this week when I was driving on the road. Was I a villain or a hero in that moment? We have bad days. We have off days. Or, or maybe we don't think about how our actions might be seen by others, might affect others. Because we usually don't intend to be Grinches. It just sneaks out. Yet each of us in our Grinchiness is loved by God. Each of us has new life and forgiveness offered to us by our loving God through Jesus Christ. Each of us can start anew. We can live in a new way. We can lose our Grinchiness and perhaps watch our hearts grow three sizes, especially in those circumstances and situations that often bring out the Grinch in us. But thinking back to our nativity scene, I'm not sure I'm ready to put King Herod among the Magi and the shepherds, but I do wonder at his story. I wonder about Herod, not necessarily as an evil character, but as a king in a position of power who was so scared of losing his power that he went to the extremes that he did. 
I wonder if I would be just as paranoid if I were afraid of each and every possibility that could threaten who I am and who I think I am and who I believe I am called to be. Maybe we can offer a bit of compassion to the villain in the story, the villains in our stories. I can only imagine the compassion and love that Jesus offers, that Jesus might offer, just as he did at the end of his earthly story. Because this story is one of hope. Hope for us. Hope that we can forgive others just as we hope others might forgive us. That we can name our mistakes or we can acknowledge our moments of grinchiness and yet know and have hope that we can change, we can forgive, and we can see others with the love of God in our hearts. So during this week, Notice your own grinchiness. Notice the grinches that you might encounter and wonder what's going on with them. Why are they feeling and acting the way that they are? And perhaps pray for them. If there's anything the nativity scene reminds us is that the coming of Christ is a gift of hope and love that supersedes anything we would normally offer. Because the love of God is bigger than our imaginations and is bigger than any Grinch that we can perhaps see, experience, or act like. So may you have a rest, a blessed rest of your week, a blessed rest of your Advent, and remember, don't be a Grinch. Go in peace.